Supper. Amen? Amen. 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 Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been what John's gospel has been building up to since the very beginning. And now in chapter 20, it's here. We started going through the gospel of John as a church family at the very beginning of this year. And now we find ourselves at the resurrection, the great victory. Why is the resurrection so important? Well, that's a big question. And to be honest with you, I don't know that we could answer that fully in our time here together. But I think two quotes by two great theologians helps kind of encapsulate why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important. English Bible scholar and theologian N.T. Wright says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project. Not to snatch people away from the earth, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. And German theologian Wolfhart Pennenberg says, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. First, it is a very unusual event. And second, if you believe it happened, you have to change the way you live. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is critically important. And what does the resurrection of Christ mean for us today? Well, again, we're not going to be able to answer all of that here in our time together. But what we're going to see in our main text here today is that the resurrected Christ turns sorrow into joy. The resurrected Christ offers peace and anointing. And the resurrected Christ overcomes doubt. Now, if you're just joining us here this morning, as a little bit of an introduction, Jesus has completed his hour. And what was his hour? Laying down his life. Laying down his life to save others by letting himself be nailed to a cross. And after ensuring that his biological mother, Mary, is going to be taken care of, he gives up his spirit in the greatest act of love the world will ever know. Afterwards, Joseph and Nicodemus come and they use their power, they use their influence, they use their rank to get Jesus' body and they prepare him for burial and they put him into a tomb in a garden near where Jesus was executed. And now we're here. Now we're here. Long text. Let's look at it together now. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived, and he went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Then I understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll, I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said 
these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were I will, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. First truth we're going to examine today is that the resurrected Christ turns sorrow into joy. The resurrected Christ turns sorrow into joy. And we see that specifically in verses 1 through 17. Let's just review those real briefly here now together. In verses 1 and 2, we see that the tomb is empty. Early Sunday morning, while it's still dark, Mary gets together. And we know from the other gospel accounts that she's, she's with some other women who were followers of Christ. And they go to anoint Jesus' body and presumably to, to mourn to mourn as well. When she and these other women get to the tomb, they see this already been opened. And Mary immediately comes back to the apostles and tells them what's happened. And that Jesus' body is no longer there. Then in verses 3 through 10, we see people, we see disciples stymied by what they've seen. Peter and the other disciple, and it's likely John, they, they run to the tomb. And there's an interesting account of just detail that the other disciple outruns Peter. But that other disciple pauses at the entrance and doesn't go in. But Peter, true to form, true to form, he just goes right in. Goes right in and he looks. Eventually the other disciple comes in too and they see the, the linens that Joseph and Nicodemus had used to prepare Jesus' body and, and there's no one in them. And the other apostle, again likely John, says that he saw and he believed. But right now it's a small belief and it's a not fully understanding belief. They didn't understand that the prophetic word of God required that Jesus the Messiah rise from the death. And so they go home not fully comprehending what all has occurred. In verses 11 through 15, we see this remarkable question. Why are you crying? Mary's back at the tomb and she's crying. She's mourning. All she knows is that Jesus is gone. That's all she knows at this point. And as she weeps, she looks into the tomb again, only this time to find two angels there, clad in white and sitting at both ends of where Jesus had been laid. And the angels ask this fascinating question, why are you crying? Why are you crying? But Mary's grief makes sense to her. To her, it's totally justifiable. They've taken her Lord away and she doesn't know where to find him. But now somebody else appears behind her and she turns and she looks and it's Jesus, but she doesn't recognize it yet. Perhaps maybe his resurrected body has changed in such a way that she doesn't recognize him, or perhaps she's just crying so intently that her vision's blurred. Whatever the reason, 
she doesn't realize who she's talking to. She, she thinks possibly it's the groundskeeper there who takes care of the garden of these tombs. But Jesus asks Mary, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And Mary explains it again, but in 16 through 17, Jesus calls her by name, Mary. And she recognizes him for who he is, and she calls out, teacher. But Jesus doesn't let her linger there. As a matter of fact, he gives her a job to do. Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers. I love that verbiage, to my brothers. And tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You know, I said last week that the word of God does not go void. It doesn't expire. Well, you know, that was true last week, and guess what? It's true this week, too. It is. You see, Jesus told the disciples just a few days prior to this right here, he told them that he was going to be resurrected, that he was actually going to turn their sorrow into joy. And in the awesome way that God works, we just talked about this in our Sunday school time. There in John 16, verses 16 through 20 and then 22, Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more. Then after a little while, you will see me. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but listen up now, but your grief will turn to joy. See, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is the time of your grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one, no one will take your joy away. Mary was beside herself with grief. But now upon seeing the resurrected Christ, her grief has turned to joy. Now we get a hint of that joy in verse 16, but Matthew 28 makes that joy abundantly clear. Matthew 28, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Now, a pastor needs to know his audience. At a year and a half, I feel like I have some idea of my audience here, okay? I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with the book, The Chronicles of Narnia. Just judging by the crowd I see here, I'm sure most of you are familiar. If you're not, The Chronicles of Narnia written by C.S. Lewis, great British apologist. And one of his books in particular, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And by the way, most of the Narnia books have all kinds of biblical and Christian allegory and themes and allusions. But The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is far and away, far and away the greatest allegory towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're not familiar with the story, it's, it's a fantasy. And these four young British children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, they find their way into this magical realm called Narnia. But Narnia is at war. It's at war between this great lion named Aslan and this witch who's trying to take the throne. See, Aslan's the true and rightful king. But when one of the boys, Edmund, is seduced by the charms of the witch, he actually agrees to betray Aslan and his own siblings. Now, eventually, Edmund repents, and he comes back to Aslan, and he comes back to his siblings. But the law of Narnia is what? It's that Edmund needs to die for the treachery that he committed. So Aslan willingly takes Edmund's place, and he dies at the hand of the witch. But you know what? At this point, if you haven't seen it, then shame on you, okay? Or read the book. And there's a lot more there, okay? <laughs> Two of the other characters, Susan and, Susan and Lucy, they actually watch this, this all take place. They actually watch this execution unfold from a distance while the witch kills Aslan. And after the witch and all of her cohorts leave, these two girls go up and they just weep over this great lion's body all night. And if you just indulge me, allow me to just read you a few more, few more words. Lewis writes, I hope no one who reads this book has been quite as miserable 
as Susan and Lucy were that night. But if you have been, if you've been up all night and cried till you have no more tears left in you, you will know that there comes in the end a sort of quietness. You feel as if nothing was ever going to happen again. At any rate, that's how it felt for these two. The rising of the sun had made everything look so different. All the colors and shadows were changed that for a moment they didn't see the important thing. Then they did. The stone table was broken into two pieces by a great crack that ran down it from end to end, and there was no Aslan. Oh, oh, cried the two girls rushing back to the table. Oh, it's too bad, sobbed Lucy. They might have left the body alone. Who's done it, cried Susan. What does it mean? Is it more magic? Yes, said a great voice behind their backs. It is more magic. They looked round, and they're shining in the sunrise, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane, for it had apparently grown again, stood Aslan himself. Oh, Aslan cried, both the girls staring at him, almost as frightened as they were glad. Aren't you dead then, dear Aslan, said Lucy? Not now, said Aslan. You're not a, not a, asked Susan in a shaky voice. She couldn't bring herself to say the word ghost. Aslan stooped his golden head and licked her forehead. The warmth of his breath and a rich sort of smell that seemed to hang about his hair came all over her. Do I look it, he said. Oh, you're real. You're real, oh, Aslan, cried Lucy, and both the girls flung themselves upon him and covered him with kisses. Now that's a story of fantasy. But the story of Jesus' resurrection is absolutely real. And the reality of mourning and grief and sorrow being turned to joy by our resurrected Jesus Christ is just as real. See, the resurrected Jesus meant sorrow turned to joy for his disciples then, and it means sorrow turned to joy for his disciples now. That's why Paul writes what he does in Romans 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen as no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There is plenty to feel sorry about in this present life. Death, disease, cultural immorality, political downfall, job loss, whatever. There is plenty to feel sorry about. And by the way, there is a time for mourning. There's a time for weeping. There's a time for grief. Romans 12, 15 makes that clear. Ecclesiastes 3 makes that clear. There's a time for those things. But that's not the end of the story. No, no, no. No, you see, our hope and our promise in the res resurrected Christ is that those things that are now subjects of sorrow will one day be turned to cause for joy. That is what the resurrected Jesus Christ does. Second truth that we see is that the resurrected Christ offers peace and anointing. And we see that in verses 18 through 23. In verse 18, Mary proclaims the resurrection. She does what Christ tells her to do. She faithfully carries out her task. She goes back and she tells the disciples everything that's occurred. But in verse 19 here, we, we see that evidently Mary's news didn't have that great of an impact initially on, on the disciples. They're living in hiding and they're living behind locked doors. And then Jesus Christ appears among them. And he tells them to be at peace. In verse 20, Jesus confirms that it is his very own physical self that stands before them in a glorified state. And yet this state still bears the scars on his hands and on his side for the price that he's paid. And when the disciples finally realize that it really is truly Jesus Christ in the flesh, they're overjoyed. Chairo is the word there in Greek, and it means to rejoice abundantly. Then in verse 21, we see that Jesus actually commissions the disciples. 
He tells them once again to be at peace. And, and then he commissions them to bring the light of Christ, his light, to others, just as God the Father had commissioned him to go and be the light. And then in verse 22, we see this anointing taking place. After commissioning the disciples with the task of spreading the gospel, he breathes on them the Holy Spirit of God. Now, this is not the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church of God like we read in Acts 2. This is, this is more of an anointing for the task that they are about to do. And that task is spreading the gospel. And then in verse 23, we see this. Hey, I'll be honest with you. It's a, it's a verse that you should pause for a second and take a look at. Verse 23, if, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What is, what, what is Jesus saying there? Well, without getting mired in the muck of Greek grammar, okay, I think the easiest way to put it to you is like this. This verse should be seen in conjunction with verse 21. It's not that the disciples have the power to forgive and not forgive, okay? It's that by the carrying out of their mission of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, the world's inhabitants will either be forgiven or not forgiven depending upon their response to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes to the apostles post-resurrection, they're sitting behind locked doors because they're afraid, and that's, frankly, all they know to do. And when Jesus appears to them, they're actually even more afraid, thinking he is some kind of a ghost. We read that in Luke 24. But then the resurrected Christ offers peace. He offers peace to them actually twice. He offers peace to his fearful disciples then, and he offers peace to his fearful disciples now. He offers peace with God. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus offers peace in this church. 1 Corinthians 14, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. And just kind of, just to put a capstone on this, really, peace in all things. That's why Philippians 4 says, Do not be anxious about what? About anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and what? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ offers his disciples peace. But you know, that peace is not just for the sake of having peace, to sit in some robe on some mountaintop and just be like, oh, yes, peace. No, that's not what we have peace for. No, that peace is actually for them going out and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why he anoints them with the Holy Spirit. That's why we have, that's part of why we have the Holy Spirit, is to share the life changing power of Jesus Christ. My brother Miles, I don't know why I'm pointing down, he's annoyingly taller than me, actually. My brother Miles. Served in the Coast Guard uh, from 2012 to 2016, and for part of his time when he was out in the when he was in the Coast Guard, he was stationed at the uh, the Umpqua River Boat Station in Winchester Bay, Oregon, there on the, the Oregon coast. And his particular unit patrolled parts of the Umpqua River and then a large section of the Pacific Coast there in Oregon as well. And one time when Kim and I were living out in Washington, we actually had the opportunity to go and visit him at his boat station. We were given a great tour, and then we actually got to go out on patrol with Miles and his, his fellow Coasties. I don't know if you've looked much at what Coast Guard boats are capable of doing, but they are incredible crafts. They really are. By the way, that picture is actually from the, uh, the Umpqua boat station, okay? They are incredible boats. And even though... Your pastor swims like a brick, okay? There's a reason why I was in the Army and not the Navy, okay? <laughs> Even though I swim like a brick, I felt totally at peace out there because these boats were just incredible. They were great boats. And it's a good thing I felt at peace out there because once you get beyond the jetty, man, you know you are on the Oregon coast. If that picture doesn't convince you, I, I really, frankly, I don't know what will. I'm glad those boats were good, not just because I'm a poor swimmer, but because they go out. You see, Coast Guard boats aren't meant to just sit in harbor. 
They're actually meant to go out on the water in the most dangerous, treacherous times, on the worst weather imaginable, when no one else wants to be out there. That's when those boats are out on the water. Why? To help rescue people who can't rescue themselves. God's people have been offered this incredible gift of peace through the Holy Spirit, through God's Holy Spirit. But you know what? That peace is not meant to just sit in harbor. It's actually meant to go out. The peace Christ offers comes when you put your faith and trust in him and his Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, abides in you. Galatians 5 tells us it's actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And it is available to every child of God who, key in now, lets the peace of God rule in their hearts. Trev, I'm not sure about that. Well, I would direct you to Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. The Holy Spirit comes abides in us and it gives us peace, but it's not just to sit idly. It's not just to be polished and parked in the harbor. See, when the advocate comes, Christ says, whom I will send to you, to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me and what? And you also must testify for you've been with me from the beginning. If you put your faith, if you put your faith and you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you have been born again, You've been anointed by the Holy Spirit, and you have been commissioned to share the life-changing and life-saving power of Jesus Christ. Third and final truth that we see here in our text here today is that the resurrected Christ overcomes doubt. Praise God that he does. We see that in verses 24 through 31. In 24 through 25, we see that Thomas needs some proof. Thomas wasn't around for verses 18 through 23. As a bit of a side note, you miss out on things when you don't gather with fellow brothers and sisters, okay? Now, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the proverbial choir here because you're all here, but that's something to think about. Thomas wasn't there. He wasn't gathered with his brothers, and he missed out. Something to think about. Something to share with your other brothers and sisters who are, who are missing out right now, to be honest with you. They're missing out. I realize, let me, let me qualify that, because we have some who would love to be here physically and they can't. And I am so grateful for the people who make it possible for us to, to reach into their homes. But for those who can and choose not to, that's missing out. And that's why I'm glad that you're here, because you're not missing out. That's why I'm glad for the people who are tuning in. My wife would love to be here, but we had a sick little boy, and I'm glad they get to tune in. Not missing out. But Thomas did. And evidently, the word of his fellow disciples is not good enough for Thomas. For him to believe in Jesus, in the resurrected Jesus, he needs to see and he needs to touch the resurrected body. But in verses 26 through 27, Jesus proves himself to Thomas. See, a week later, Thomas receives the answer to his doubts. Now, interestingly, we find that the disciples are still living behind locked doors. They have not yet received the peace that Christ offers. But Jesus appears to them again, and again he offers them peace, and then he calls Thomas to himself. And Jesus fulfills every one of Thomas's requirements for belief. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then in verse 28, Thomas has received all the proof he needs, and he proclaims, my Lord and my God, you are the master of my life because you are God Almighty. And then in verse 29, I'm so grateful for verse 29. Jesus gave Thomas what he needed to believe and Thomas believed because of what he saw and because of what he touched. But then Jesus assigns blessing to people like you and me. People like you and me. Jesus has assigned blessing. Blessing for who? Blessing for those who have believed through the eyes of faith. And then in verse 30 through 31, John caps off this chapter 
caps off this chapter with letting his readers know that Jesus did even more miraculous things among his disciples. And John has recorded these specific events for us. Why? That we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. As a point of clarification, there's a difference between testing and doubting. Okay, let me give you a little bit of an example of that. Testing. We see an example of that in Matthew 16. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, Jesus that is, he replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. Now that's an example of testing. Let me give you an example of doubt, other than the one that we've read about just now. You see, John the Baptist, in John 1, John is one of the first people to make such a bold, clear proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And yet we read in Matthew 11, when John the Baptist is thrown into prison, guess what? He has some doubts. This guy who baptized Jesus, who saw all these amazing things, who was the first one to say, Jesus is the Messiah. That is the guy. That is the one who's going to save us. Now, how can this guy have such doubts? But he does. Because things aren't going the way he thought that they were going to be going. So he actually sends, sends people to him. Well, let me just read you part of it. Matthew 11. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to him, that is Jesus, sent his disciples to him to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? You make no mistake, John is, John is wondering, are you, Jesus, are you really the Messiah? This is not going the way I thought it was going to go. And what, what does Jesus do here? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What's Jesus' response to John the Baptist here? Well, let me tell you what it's not. He doesn't criticize John. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't say what, what a terrible Baptist he is, okay? No. No, what he actually tells John is that, yes, I am the Messiah. And he affirms that he's the Messiah. He reassures John that he's the Messiah by proclaiming that, yes, the Messianic prophecies that were proclaimed in the book of Isaiah, they are being fulfilled in me. He reassures John. He reassures John that he is, in fact, who he claims to be. Hey, I'm not going to tell you that this section is the greatest hour in Thomas's life, okay? But I don't know that we should give him too hard of a time. Just a few chapters back, he was the only one who was willing to go be martyred with Christ, okay? But he's got some doubts here. He's got some doubts. And Jesus meets him at his doubts, and he overcomes those doubts by proving himself to be real. Now, having doubt can be seen as, as a sign of weak faith in some Christian circles. But, you know, the Scottish evangelist, biologist, and writer Henry Drummond, he argues this. He says, we are born questioners. Look at the wonderment of a child in its eyes before it can speak. The child's great word when it begins to speak is, why? Every child is full of every kind of question about the world in which it lives. That is the incipient doubt in the nature of man. Respect doubt for its origin. It is an inevitable thing. It is not a thing to be crushed. It is a part of man as God made him. Doubt, he writes, is the prelude to knowledge. Friends, I would argue that doubt is only bad if we're content to merely sit in our doubt. Doubt's not a bad thing, however, if we use it as a catalyst to help us find the truth, to discover the truth. And the fact of the matter is, we're going to have some doubts in our lives. That's going to happen. Let me urge you to not stop at your doubts. When doubt arises, don't test God. Seek God. 
Seek God. Seek God that he may prove himself real to you in the time and in the manner that he chooses. God tells his people in Deuteronomy 4, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Proverbs 8, God says, I love those who love me and those who seek me, find me. Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And lest you think this is just an Old Testament thing, Matthew 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And the one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. If you're struggling with doubt, if you're struggling with doubt, seek God. Seek him out with all of your heart that he may prove himself real to you. If you're not yet living a new life in Christ, let me just put three things to you. This life is filled with sorrow. We live in a broken, fallen world that has run amok. If you want hope that one day that sorrow will turn into joy, you need to turn to Christ. Wish there was a better way I could put it, but there's not. If you're not yet living a new life in Christ, maybe today you're doing all right, but you know what? Maybe you are completely dreading tomorrow because you don't know what tomorrow holds. Life's pretty uncertain. If you want a peace that overshadows that uncertainty, you need Christ in your life. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, Trev, this news about Jesus, it sounds pretty good, but I got some doubts. Well, guess what? God can handle your doubts. What he won't handle is your apathy, okay? Seek him out. If you want a relationship with him, seek him. Ask questions. Talk to those who are already walking with God. Fellowship with them. Study the word of God, and and I would strongly encourage you to pray. Pray that God would meet you at your doubts to overcome them. Seek him with honesty. Seek him with integrity. Seek him with tenacity. And let him prove himself real to you. Now, if you're already living a new life in Christ, you don't have to convince me that there are a lot of sad things in this world right now. I have a TV too. There are. But our hope and our promise in the resurrected Jesus Christ is that we don't just stay in sorrow forever. And that the things that are reasons for sorrow today will one day become cause for celebration. They will become cause for joy exceedingly. If you're already living a new life in Christ, you and I have a will. To whatever degree, we have a will. And that means we have some level of choice. And we can choose to abide in the peace of Christ or not. I hope, I hope we choose to abide in the peace of Jesus Christ. Take it. It is offered to God's children. All we need to do is abide in it. And then don't let that peace just be parked in harbor. Take it out. Take it out on the water. Take it out and share it in the life-changing and life-saving power of Jesus Christ. Finally, if you're already living a new life in Christ, you're going to have times of doubt in your life. It's going to happen. Don't just stay there in your doubts. Seek God. Ask ask questions, study the word, pray, fast, worship. When you're doubting worship, yeah, yeah. Seek God. Seek him with all of your heart that he will meet you at your doubts and overcome them. Let him meet you at your doubts and bring you to the place where you say, my Lord and my God. Let's close with a hymn.